Thank you. So, uh, so this, this uh, talk is a nice bridge from what Tyler just uh, uh, spoke about. So uh, I'm going to, these are my disclosures. So uh, just a quick uh, cartoon uh, depicting uh, the uh, general posterior osteotomy techniques. And this, this is from an article that, that, uh, that was published a few years ago on ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, you know, we, we use the term Smith-Peterson osteotomy pretty uh, you know, uh, cavalier, uh, but, but uh, if, you, if you look at the original Smith-Peterson osteotomy, uh, the original description of it was a anterior column lengthening uh, and, and posterior column shortening procedure at the same time. And so you get a, a pretty big correction uh, similar to the, what you would achieve from a pedicle subtraction osteotomy uh, when you have that anterior column lengthening. So uh, when you do what we uh, uh, colloquially refer to as a Smith-Peterson osteotomy today, uh, it really is a polysegmental wedge osteotomy where you remove the posterior facet joints uh, on both sides uh, with uh, midline lamina. Uh, these are the ponte osteotomies that you see. And, and this, this type of correction uh, achieves about 5 to 10 degrees per level, uh, whereas this type of correction achieves around 30 degrees. And so uh, this type of correction, as uh, Tyler mentioned, is only achievable uh, when you have some degree of flexibility uh, in the spine. So if you have a fixed sagittal plane deformity from ankylosing spondylitis uh, or from you know, a flat back uh, syndrome, someone who's had a previous fusion and was fused into kyphosis, uh, you know, you're going to want to use a heavier duty osteotomy, uh, whereas if you have some degree of flexibility that relies on, uh, see how this disc space becomes uh, short in the posterior aspect and is, is stretched to its limit in the anterior aspect, you need to have some degree of flexibility to your disc space in order to take advantage of, of the, uh, these polysegmental wedge osteotomies. So uh, we're going to uh, move on to a case just to I illustrate uh, uh, this, these, these principles uh, a little bit. So it's, a, it's an interesting case, a uh, 59-year-old woman uh, who had a previous T2 to iliac fusion uh, that was done in California uh, sometime, and, and she moved uh, to Baltimore and uh, 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 developed a pseudarthrosis at L2-3. Uh, she uh, was treated by a, one of my former uh, partners, uh, and uh, uh, at the time, uh, what what he wanted to do was a uh, uh, focal treatment at at two three, uh, at where she had the uh, the pseudarthrosis, and so a, a D lift was performed at that level, and because she was so solidly fused distally, the hardware uh, distal to that was removed. So, uh, so while she initially did well from, from that treatment and had recovery of her symptoms, uh, she started to develop progressive kyphosis and then presented to the ER with cauda equina uh, syndrome. So you can see uh, over here, uh, she's, she's uh, uh, significantly imbalanced. Uh, this is where they did the, the uh, D-lift and she still has her old hardware up uh, from, from uh, T2 down to, to uh, L1 uh, and then, or L2, and then there's this L2-3 uh, D-lift. So uh, looking at the uh, pelvic parameters, uh, you can see that she's compensating a great deal uh, with uh, her pelvic tilt, uh, and uh, you can see that that uh, she's uh, got a significant uh, uh, mismatch. She's uh, very, very kyphotic. The uh, important point, that, which you don't appreciate until you see this on CT, uh, is the fact that she had a very bad sacral fracture 
uh, and that was part of the reason why she was so bent forward and kyphotic, and the reason for her cauda equina uh, was due to this as well. Um, so uh, a pretty substantial uh, problem. So, uh, so basically, uh, in order to address the sacral fracture, uh, we plan to do instrumentation down to the pelvis. Uh, and uh, in order to address her sagittal balance, I decided to do a PSO uh, at L1. And, uh, and this was the, the result. You can see that uh, we got a, a good correction of her, of her sagittal alignment. The plumb line uh, goes down. Uh, normally, she's standing straight uh, and uh, uh, is doing uh, tremendously better. You can see she's got some reconstitution of the lumbar lordosis. And uh, this is two years uh, later. Uh, she's uh, really doing uh, uh, a lot better. Uh, this is a CT scan from two years later uh, showing that that, that sacral fracture uh, has really amazingly healed uh, and, you know, very Im impressive. Uh, ability for this woman to fuse. I think she has this natural uh, predisposition to fuse, so it's surprising to me that she developed this pseudarthrosis. Um, but, uh, but, but you can see that, that this, when you go to the original CT over here, uh, wh while I was intending to do a PSO, uh, what really ended up happening uh, was during the process of doing the PSO, uh, she really ended up having an inadvertent SPO, uh, one of the old-fashioned SPOs where you have that anterior column lengthening. So you can see that this is a disruption of the anterior column right here. And in the middle of doing the, uh, the PSO, uh, she, the, the, the spine suddenly snapped. Uh, and, and I no noticed immediately that the correction was achieved instantaneously. And so, so it was actually the easiest PSO I've ever done, you know, because, uh, because of that, that uh, phenomenon. Um, but fortunately, you know, that's the whole reason why we have the temporary rods, you, you, you know. So the temporary rod salvaged that patient. This was L1. That could have easily resulted in a permanent uh, uh, deficit. Yes? It, it, correct. Yeah, and, and so and so that was going to lead on to the next uh, uh, thing, which is a, a video of uh, this. This was actually from uh, this was supposed to be a book chapter from uh, uh, Alfredo Quinones. Remember that video atlas? But somehow the, I don't think that ever uh, amounted to anything. So so uh, so this this. Uh, 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 is just depicting getting your instrumentation in. Uh, you can see that this is a patient who had a, a pretty focal kyphosis. Uh, we have a lot of patients with osteomyelitis discitis at University of Maryland. This is someone who has uh, been uh, you know, healed osteomyelitis discitis, who uh, healed into a state of kyphosis. And, uh, and so, so the, what you want to start out with uh, is a central decompression, uh, uh, especially in an area where there has been previous infection uh, or previous surgery. Uh, very important to remove all of the scar tissue and to get fresh dura, uh, and uh, to or to get as as close to fresh dura as you can, because the dura ends up uh, becoming somewhat redundant. Uh, during the osteotomy closure. And if you have a whole bunch of scar sitting on top of that dura, uh, it's going to become even more of a problem than the standard buckling itself. So, uh, so as you can see, this is uh, 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 the application of a temporary rod. You know, I, I put the temporary rod on after I've started the removal of the pedicles on both sides. Uh, and uh, once uh, you start going into vertebral body work, uh, before you start proceeding to the vertebral body work, you, you want to put on a temporary rod. So, uh, so uh, it's a good idea uh, 
if you have someone with ankylosing spondylitis who might be somewhat brittle like the lady that uh, uh, we just discussed, uh, important to have probably more than uh, just one uh, uh, fixation point above and below the osteotomy construct. So, uh, so you can see we're uh, retracting uh, the thecal sac uh, over here uh, and drilling the uh, part of the, the rest of the vertebral body and pedicle uh, over here. And uh, uh, it's just a sequential uh, process of going from side to side uh, and uh, uh, applying uh, 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 hemostatic agents, you know, thrombin gel foam uh, can go in on this side, you know, and you let that clot off a little bit and then you work on the other side. And you can see despite the presence of this temporary rod, you still have a lot of room to work. It's not like you can't do your surgery with a temporary rod in place. The temporary rod is, is not a big hindrance to, to doing this. Um, you know, the, the, uh, this is depicting further lateral uh, dissection, uh, exposing the nerve roots uh, on either side. And, uh, and uh, re really trying to get a very thorough uh, uh, decompression such that you can see both nerve roots in their entirety uh, uh, on, on both sides. Uh, it's such that by the time you close the osteotomy, you have nothing that's impinging upon uh, those nerve roots. Uh, the other thing is that you're going to get a lot less buckling uh, if you remove bone centrally above and, and below uh, the osteotomy site. So very important to, to do a, a good central uh, decompression uh, prior to the closure of the osteotomy and to uh, have uh, uh, good fresh uh, planes between the dura and the ligamentum flavum such that when you do the closure, uh, the dura and will essentially slide and not be stuck to the surrounding uh, uh, bony anatomy. Um, this is a sort of a central cancellation of the pedicle, decancellation of the pedicle and you know, once you drill away the center of the pedicle, then you can easily bite off uh, the uh, cortical margin uh, of the pedicle. And so and it's just sequential drilling. Uh, you can see that there's not much blood coming out on this side because we pack that off. Uh, and you just sequentially go from side to side and uh, pack off with thrombin gel form or, or uh, flow seal. Uh, and, uh, and that way you can help uh, m minimize uh, your blood loss during this process. So, uh, so once you've uh, uh, done a satisfactory removal of some of the uh, components of the vertebral body, it's at this point where you slide in uh, this uh, uh, osteotome underneath the fecal, the fecal sac in order to uh, cut away the bone uh, from the uh, posterior margin of the vertebral body. And uh, at, this, at this point as well, uh, it's uh, uh, important to uh, make sure that you also uh, uh, have had satisfactory clearance underneath the dura. You know, this is, that was inserted uh, uh, with the assurance that the dura was detached from uh, the, uh, the uh, PLL and that there was mobility. So this is uh, using the, the mallet, uh, we'll just break through uh, across and then into the uh, uh, osteotomy cavity. So, uh, so uh, now uh, we're going to put the contralateral rod on uh, as the, uh, that's the, the final contralateral rod uh, to help us compress across it. So you can see that, that uh, you know, once you get that 
that uh, that contralateral rod on, then you can sequentially uh, compress across the osteotomy site and uh, the osteotomy uh, will start to close. It's at this point where you want to check your your signals, uh, you know, uh, getting, uh, making sure you have free running EMGs and uh, 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 making sure that that as the osteotomy is being closed that you're not creating a, a new uh, deficit is uh, important. And so you, and similar to what Tyler was saying, you want to do it gradually from side to side. You don't want to do one big sweep on one side all of a sudden. So you can see it, we got a good uh, uh, correction of that of that deformity. And, uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. So, um, so that, that's a, a video of a, of a, you know, of a case that, that uh, is a good example of how you go about dealing with a fixed sagittal plane deformity. That patient had uh, a, a post-infectious uh, fixed sagittal plane deformity. And, uh, and so if you have a fixed deformity, uh, you know, PSO is, is the way to go if, if you, for a good correction. And, you know, if it's a flexible deformity, um, then, you know, and fortunately most of the deformities are, do have some degree of flexibility to it. Uh, you know, I think Smith-Peterson osteotomies uh, or polysegmental wedge osteotomies can be achieved at multiple levels and you can get, you know, five to 10 degrees per level. All right, any questions?